joining us is John Weir, Research Associate with the Department of Natural Resource Ecology and Management. Well, John, I want to talk today about prescribed fire because I think there's a lot of uh, misunderstanding about it in the community, yet our colleagues promote prescribed burning as a wonderful resource for managing land. Tell me about some of the benefits. Okay. Uh, you know, fire, fire is a naturally occurring process. Uh, you know, historically it occurred through lightning, but actually probably the largest implementation of fire that occurred historically was Native Americans, mm -hmm. people. People burned. The Native Americans saw the benefit of fire. They used the benefit of fire in their everyday life, and that's been well documented that fire was very important for, for all aspects of their life. And so they saw those benefits. And again, as, 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 this country was settled and stuff by European man. Fire was kind of taboo in their culture and stuff that they brought up and that fire wasn't important. So fire became less important. And so with that less importance of fire, we've been reaping a lot of the, the bad things about lack of fire. We have a huge increase of eastern red cedar in this country. Right. The eastern red cedar is a very fire intolerant species. It doesn't like fire. It, it occurs naturally. It's, it's native to Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. And then it's, it's spread with over 100 years of fire suppression that we've had since settlement of this state. We've had this huge increase of eastern red cedar. Also again, many of our other native plants that we have are very well adapted to fire mm -hmm. through their mechanisms that fire can come through. It will top kill them. The top of the plant will die. But the roots re-sprout from the base, from the roots or different parts of it, they'll re-sprout and come back more vigorous and better. And within that, those plants become more beneficial to wildlife, livestock, and other things. Because as you let a plant grow, you don't top kill it, let it grow, it just gets tall, it gets rank in that growth. Yeah. And so, like a lot of the browse species that deer and a lot of the wildlife species prefer, it's not not available because it's way up high. So it's like when mom used to put the cookie jar on top of the refrigerator, you couldn't get to it. Those those brows and, and, and very palatable plants, they're not palatable anymore because they're way up here. But if you top kill them with fire, they re-sprout, everything's down at a level stuff can eat and utilize and very well, you know, high nutritional quality and things like that. So it's huge benefit, not only to the plant community, but also our, all of our native wildlife that we have in this state. You know, a lot of times people come in and they manage fire, or they, they do mechanical treatment on their cedars, cut them down, and stuff like that. And I've seen a lot of areas where people do that, and then and within six to eight years, it's grown back exactly like it was beforehand mm -hmm. because they didn't manage all those little seedlings that were hidden in the grass that the, that the cutter couldn't get to, that right. you didn't see it. Also, you get a huge seed release whenever you take that canopy away from those larger trees mm -hmm. that come back. So you get a huge release. With fire, we can run a, you know, we can still do our mechanical treatment, control our trees mechanically, come back and run a fire in there periodically. We'll knock all those little seedlings back and we'll maintain that prairie or that grassland setting. I want to look at how some of our native plants are adapted to that. We have, um, you mentioned the shrubs, uh, right. sumac, and buckbrush, blackberries, uh, sand plum. And if we look at those, we could see the stems hit by fire right. will die out, but we'll get new shoots come coming right from back. Yeah, most of them are very adapted to. And parts of our grasslands actually do have that the cross timbers where there's grass right. mixed with the mixed with oaks, oaks. You betcha. And but if we look at that bark, it's real thick and corky. And that's a lot of times you can tell how a tree or a, a tree or a shrub will respond to fire. Is you know does it re-sprout after it's killed? Also, how does it protect itself? Most of all those blackjacks, post oaks, they're real, they're, you know, they're a real extreme hot fire, yeah, you can, you know, top kill them, but a typical surface fire going through leaf litter will, really won't harm most oak trees because you look at the thick bark that, like you said, the thick bark that they have protects that underlying areas on that tree so they don't get hurt by the fire. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you look at a lot of the trees that are invading a lot of our grassland areas and even some of our cross timbers areas like some of the elms and stuff that come in, they're really thin barked and fire really knocks them back really quick and easy because they're thin barked. But the problem is they just don't produce a lot of fuel. You look at their leaves and stuff, they're not really adapted for that. Whereas oak leaves and stuff, big leaves, they kind of produce a lot of leaves most, most years get a good bed of leaf litter, they can create a good fire to, to help kick back a lot of those undesirable woody species that come in and invade those forest areas as well. Uh, we have extension publications on using prescribed fire. Uh, 
burn associations, and that's where groups of landowners get together in an area, pull the resources, equipment, and work together and help each other burn. They have two good, really good videos on uh, using prescribed fire in Oklahoma and also a good video on, on fire effects. Well, excellent. Thank you so much for yeah. sharing all the wonderful information with us. You're welcome.